Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is gonna be on using HCL or hydrochloric acid with an H. pylori infection. We're gonna give you my clinical insights on having worked with thousands of patients with these type of infections. Should you use HCL or should you not? All right, before we dive in, make sure you smash that like button. Really appreciate it. Put your comments down below. Let me know what you've done in the past. We like to get other people's clinical feedback. That's how you learn a lot. All right, let's dive in. So what is H. pylori? I've done a lot of videos on this post or on this topic. H. pylori is a bacterial infection, a gram-negative bacterial infection. It's a helical shape, right? H stands for helicobacter pylori. It's in a significant percent of the population, 50% or so. Again, we're more concerned when it's at a higher or a more pathological level. And we'll do PCR testing, genetic testing for it, and we'll be able to see how high the H. pylori level is. We also look at clinical symptoms. Do we have any indigestion, bloating, constipation, diarrhea? Also, H. pylori can cause other problems like mood issues, energy issues, cognitive issues. So we always look at the atypical symptoms. If I see H. pylori borderline, or, or positive, we're definitely going to address it. And most people that have H. pylori, it's usually H. pylori and maybe a bacterial overgrowth, H. pylori and fungal overgrowth, H. pylori and some other kind of infection. It's very rarely just H. pylori just by itself. It can be, and it can still be a big problem. So H. pylori is association with stomach cancer, gut inflammation, etc. It can thin out the gut lining. It can create atrophic gastritis. It can thin out the gut lining. So H. pylori, you have to be very careful when using hydrochloric acid and H. pylori. Now, H. pylori uses defense mechanisms to actually alkalinize the gut. It tries to move away from an acid environment and it tries to increase the acidity. It moves towards a higher level. Now, when you do a urea breath test to look for a test for H. pylori, they'll give you some urea, you'll swallow it, and then they'll measure CO2 levels because urea, or the metabolites of protein, right, will hit your H. pylori, and it makes an enzyme called urease, and that urease will take the urea and spit it into, um, it will spit it into CO2, which is what they test positive with an H. pylori breath test, that elevation in CO2 means positive H. pylori, and they'll also spit out ammonia, and ammo ammonia's got a pH of 11, which is very alkaline. Remember, the, the scale is kind of one's pure acid, seven's water in the middle, 14's pure alkaline. And so when you go up to an 11, that's very alkaline from that typical intestinal environment it's going to be around 1.5 to 2.5. So it's moving it away from an acidic environment. And that's not good because we need good acidity to activate our proteolytic enzymes. It takes pepsinogen to pepsin. It gets that whole proteolytic enzyme cascade moving. It gets that nice chyme mixture of all that food and and gastric juices, nice and nice and um, acidic, and that acid then triggers a whole bunch of uh, enzymatic cascades when that food gets released to the small intestine. Also, that acidity helps keep the gut relatively sterile, right? A lot of acids are antimicrobial, okay? Acids are antimicrobial. It's part of the reason why people with SIBO, they usually don't have enough bile support, and bile is another kind of acid, bile acids, hydrochloric acid. So we need that good mixture of gastric juices that's nice and acidic, that then dumps into our small intestine, which triggers cholecystic kinin to, to release more bile acids, which help emulsify and break down fat. It also helps trigger good enzymatic release from the pancreas, good lipase, lipolytic enzymes, fat digestive enzymes, also proteolytic enzymes, which are going to be protein digestive enzymes. So if we don't have good enzyme production and good acidity, a lot of times those foods could ferment, rancidify, putrefy. Basically, ferment means rotting carbs. Um, putrefy means rotting protein, and rancidify means rotting fat. So we have to have good protein, fat, and carb digestion, or we're going to have gas and bloating. And a lot of times these gases can disrupt our motility. So some people come into the game with a really thinned out gut lining where it's just very thin, and they can't really tolerate much HCL, and that may happen. So I always tell patients out of the gate, start with a little bit of um, apple cider vinegar or a little bit of lemon juice. Try a teaspoon of that in some water a couple minutes before you eat your meal. See how you feel. If you do okay with it, then we can always ratchet our way up and always go into it a hydrochloric acid capsule form if we can. If that's a problem, then we have to just back off and just focus more on enzymes and do more gut healing, gut building, gut restoration, right? Zinc, glutamine, maybe um, bone broth, collagen, glycine, aloe, DGL, those kinds of you know, okra, those kinds of really good nutrients. I have a powder called GI Restore is what I use in my practice put the link below and we'll take that on an empty stomach. It's very healing and soothing and builds back that gut lining. 
But the first thing we have to do when we have a thinned out gut lining is one, make sure we break down the food really well, right? Ideally, not a whole bunch of raw foods, uh, good enzyme production, good chewing up of the food, not overly dilute the digestive enzymes, right? Don't hydrate too much when you eat. 10 minutes before, two hours after is ideal. Uh, ginger tea with Manuka honey is wonderful. It'll really calm that gut lining as well. And then we may add a tiny bit of acid in there and test with apple cider vinegar or lemon juice first, and then taper our way up into hydrochloric acid capsules. All right, and if you ever have any burning or warmness on the way up, you can always just pull back. My general recommendation when you're taking HCL capsules is to always do it with food. Have food in your stomach already. May not be the best when you're doing it with water. If you're doing like an ACV, you can put a little bit of water, shoot it down, and then start eating within a minute or two so you have food in there helping to absorb it. But that's a good like starting point. Every now and then I get patients that have a delay reaction where they're a month in or three, four weeks in and they taper up and they may have give themselves a gastritis or a tummy irritation. If that happens, no big deal. Try to pull back and see if you can get that pain or irritation to, to go away. If it can't, you can always do a three to seven day supplement holiday to get that inflammation down. I tell patients if that ever happens, ginger tea, manuka honey, bone broth, collagen amino acids, really soothing. And then you can also add in, of course, my GI Restore, which is the glutamine, the aloe, the DGL, the zinc, the okra, really good healing, soothing nutrients. And also don't forget, like just making more bone broths and soups and stews and using an instant pot to cook your food really does help um, make your food more digestible. A lot of energy goes into the digestive process. So if you can pre-digest your food with cooking methods, like the ones I mentioned, that's gonna make it a lot easier on your tummy. So hope it helps out of the gates. You really wanna dial in HCL accordingly. Some people may not be able to tolerate it with H. pylori, some can. Sometimes the H. pylori could be what's really keeping that gut raw. So my whole thing is make sure you're breaking down your food so your food's not a problem. Make sure you're chewing your food up. Make sure you're not overly hydrating with your food where it's diluting your enzymes and acids and making your gut more alkaline. Make sure you're avoiding food allergens, right? Make sure they're broken down well so there's not too much fiber in there. And then we typically would move into a more of a paleo template or a more modified type of specialized diet um, if we go deeper. And again, getting tested for H. pylori is important. I always tell patients, set the table first. If we can get acid in there, great. If we can't, we just use, our, use enzymes or we use bitters and we use a lot of healing nutrients to get the gut ready. So then when we go into killing mode, we're not gonna overly create any intestinal inflammation when we start killing. Hope it helps out of the gates. Again, this is Dr. Jay here. I see treated hundreds of H. pylori patients, thousands with gut issues over you know, 10 plus years. If you wanna work with someone like myself because you're, you know, you're stuck and you're not quite sure what direction to go and click down below, there'll be a link for you to schedule with myself and or my colleagues. Be happy to help you out. And if you enjoyed the content, please give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. Share with friends and family. And I hope you all have a phenomenal day. Let me open it up to a couple of questions here and see if I can help. All right, started HCL pepsin though, but started getting burning up in my throat, sensation, stopped HCL, felt better. Does that just mean I have plenty of acid already? Not necessarily, good question. So just because you add in HCL and you have some warmness or burning does not mean you have plenty of acid. It's, it's possible. Now, I say that probably if you don't have any gut issues, that's probably possible, but it could also mean that your gut levels, your gut's very thin. So if you have that type of reaction and you already have some digestive issues going on, you probably don't have enough stomach acid. You probably have um, a deficiency, but your gut lining is so thin, it's just getting irritated. Like the analogy I always give to my patient, it's like you need a back massage or a chiropractic adjustment, but you just went outside and got a sunburn. Even though you need it, it's gonna be like pain, very painful if you go and get a massage, even though you need it. Doesn't mean you don't need it, it just means the timing of it isn't right. And so I would put more focus on enzymes and, and ginger and healing nutrients and come back to it down the road if you can. If not, we just use bitters and enzymes in the meantime. Yeah, you're totally welcome, thank you so much. Reason I started to begin with was with bloating after meals. Yeah, you probably don't have enough acid. It's an, a nice conclusion to come to. It's like, oh, maybe there's, maybe there's too much acid. Probably not in your case. Now, if you have really good digestion and you want to try HCL and it makes your digestion worse or you have more irritation, maybe that's too much, right? It's hard to say. So if you have symptoms and you add HCL and you get more acidity, 
early on, it's probably more of a atrophic gastritis problem. Low kind of thinning of that gut lining is probably more of the, the big picture issue. Good question. And other issue is um, regarding enzymes. So we want a combination of proteolytic enzymes, um, lipolytic fat digestive enzymes, and ideally maybe some amylytic or, or carbohydrate-based enzymes. And also, people have a lot of gut irritation issues. A lot of times, there's a lot of FODMAP sensitivity. So be very careful with FODMAPs. They tend to drive a lot of acid reflux and or sensitivity. And also, a lot of times with gastritis, we need good HCL to trigger the closing of that esophageal sphincter, that esophageal sphincter. And if we don't close it, we can start to have GERD and other issues. So it's possible that gastritis, which is just basically stomach inflammation, can eventually move its way up and start creating some kind of a reflux of issue, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. Um, so you got to be very careful with that. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's content. If you did, let me know down below. And if you want to reach out, link is there for y'all as well. All right, you guys have a phenomenal day. Take care, y'all. Bye now. Take your face.